As a resident anthropologist around here, I have an observation to make. Christmas specials are weird. Film, music, television shows, all of these exhibit occasional dabbles into the Christmas spirit without their core theme necessarily being all that Christmassy. When series like Showtime's Dexter even have an annual focus on a Christmas theme, it's become saturated throughout the entire culture. Just like romantic subplots, Western audiences expect that to be in their stories. One staring at our culture from outside of it may wonder why one religion's holiday receives such fanfare across so many different groups. While there are other holidays that happen this time of year, hence many adopting the practice of saying happy holidays instead, Christmas has been a tradition in conflict for quite a number of years. Put simply, Christmas was once illegal. Strap in, kids, it's time for History Ruins Everything. In the 17th century, Puritans in England, like unfun versions of Protestants, decided their Catholic king was wrong in so many ways, worst of all in Christmas celebrations. You see, the English actually celebrated the 12 days of Christmas for 12 days, each filled with more booze and cavorting than the last. Men like Oliver Cromwell, perceived leader of the Puritan movement, did not care for this at all. Under his leadership and other Puritan influences, celebrating Christmas was a punishable offense from 1647 until 1670. That's a long time to wait for gifts. While families and even public figures tried to keep Christmas alive for themselves, that's over three decades of oppression for the holiday. After that long, a new generation doesn't even know the traditions, and many have no investment in keeping them going. For perspective, imagine if America could not celebrate Christmas from the end of World War II until 1970. That's a bunch of baby boomer Scrooges. So how did the culture of Christmas survive this setback? For a while, it didn't. History lesson aside, things were very distracting for much of the Western world over the next century and a half. Industrial Revolution brought more population to the cities, factories worked their people harder and longer, and making time for Christmas seemed like an unnecessary practice. It was beginning to look like the fervor around Christmas would never revive, despite the efforts of writers of the era like Washington Irving attempting to bring the spirit back. One man, though, struck gold in this pursuit. Charles Dickens. You may recognize the name in connection with a certain Christmas carol, told literally over a hundred different ways and parodied dozens of times. He took six weeks to write this novella in five staves, or chapters, his main publisher refused to pay him in full for his work due to poor sales of his previous story, so he published it himself in December of 1843. The first edition sold out before that Christmas. So what makes A Christmas Carol the perfect fire to not only rekindle Ebenezer Scrooge's spirit, but the whole of the Western worlds? Well, let's dig into this classic and find out. First, we must examine which version best tells the original tale. As of this year, there are 54 stage plays, 29 TV specials, 20 radio dramas, 19 feature films, 11 known recordings, 4 operas! That's a lot of different views of the same story. But if you read the original text, it makes sense. This story was written as a novella, more as prose than a traditional tale. The characters are described with vivid descriptors, but their actions and dialogues are relatively short, and most scenes portrayed in other mediums contain 90% of what Dickens wrote 170 years ago. So putting aside parodies and other variations, that's over 100 true to the original versions to consider. I guess we start with stave one, Marley's Ghost. Scrooge is working on Christmas Eve, along with the cold Bob Cratchit, and taking visitors against his will at his place of business. His nephew Fred wishes him Merry Christmas, to which he replies, Bah humbug. Scrooge and Fred both symbolize different ideas dominant in society at the time. The rich versus the poor, productivity versus purpose, is an age-old battle that's still taking place on competing news networks to this day. Bob Cratchit shows agreement and even support of Fred's ideas before catching himself and getting back to work, which Scrooge reprimands him and says your situation may change if you continue that tone. He's supposed to be what the masses identify with. We want the ideals of Christmas that Fred promotes to be true while working for people like Scrooge and trying to keep our heads down. Bob Cratchit is supposed to be the common man, not rich, not destitute, somewhere in the middle class, which was a fairly new role at that point in history. The story about extremes holds Mr. Cratchit and his family at its center, caught somewhere between the ideal and the harsh realities of the world. That's where Tiny Tim Cratchit comes in. He's... he's hopeful, and... Uh, excuse me, I <laughs> need to finish this passage quick. 
<laughs> He's possibly the most important symbol that the story has, a small, optimistic, sickly beacon of Christmas joy. One could argue that this crippled, smiling child is the true spirit of Christmas that, without a great deal of lines or time spent in the story, leaves the greatest impact on the audience, who wish to see him carry on despite the odds against it. So each major character has a central role they're reflecting within society, and one of them is in the worst mental shape despite his banks being the fullest. Scrooge wants nothing from the world except that which it owes him, which he believes is everything. If only he had a friend who could guide him on a better path. Who are you? Ask me who I was. All right, all right, who were you then? In life, I was your partner. Jacob Marley. That works. Jacob Marley is literally in the first sentence of the novella, as he was Scrooge's business partner and only friend who passed away before the story started. Charles Dickens within the story makes special note as to why he begins the tale this way by comparing Marley to Hamlet's dad, dead before the story starts, but integral to its course. Jacob Marley finished his life as he lived it, pinching pennies until they bled. He and Scrooge were two parts of a poison, perfectly brewed together to give misery to those they lent to. Were they in the wrong? By the law, no. Did they help out those they lent to? Technically, yes. All this gray leads to one inevitable conclusion. Chains. The chains symbolize how people bind themselves to their own pursuits so exclusively that they blind themselves to the plights of others. Marley was willingly ignorant of those that had trouble paying his debts, so he must now carry his hoard with him in death. It's kind of a weighty message, but at the same time, it's just another version of karma. If you don't give it out, you take it with you, and it weighs you down. Scrooge is told his chains are heavier than the myriad worn by Marley, so he'll give him a chance he never had. The chance to change before it's too late. There's so much to unpack and we're still just in the first stave. So on to the second, the ghost of Christmas past. Sometimes shown as a child, other times as a flickering flame, this spirit is always soft-spoken and reminding Scrooge that what he sees are shadows of what were. What was will always be, cannot be changed. It shows a lonely childhood, where Christmas joys were not felt because Scrooge's father was cruel and unjust. Could this symbolize Oliver Cromwell's Puritan regime and its banning of Christmas? It would make sense at the time of the writing, and also during an important developmental stage of Scrooge's life, he did not get Christmas consistently. While he has all the freedom to celebrate it later, was he ever in the practice from childhood? I see the correlations. Scrooge then goes to his former employer, who kept Christmas traditions alive for himself, his family, and his staff. Despite Scrooge's participation and enjoyment of the events, he had no habit to keep them up once he left Fezziwig's business and started his own. Even though the Christmas traditions were not all forgotten, the habit of celebrating them started to fall out of the norm, and without these traditions practiced year after year, they begin to fade like memories of the past long past. Scrooge's focus on his wealth and growing business over himself costs him dearly, which he dismissed at the time as wistful and youthful ambitions going to the wayside. Ebenezer watches his younger self throw this opportunity of happiness away and cannot accept what he sees. While at the time he thought no great loss, reflecting back on it, he realized that cutting enjoyment from life in the name of progress is why misery loves companies. That's not the actual phrase, but it works well enough for this instance. In Stav 3 comes the ghost of Christmas present, probably the most troubling spirit Scrooge encounters. His tone goes from jovial to snide to sobering as he pulls no punches when Scrooge asks of Tiny Tim's fate. Say Tiny Tim will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Die? No, spirit. No. He's the tone of people on Christmas Day in high spirits, but aware that reality exists outside this tiny pocket of time. And while he may end when Christmas Day passes, he will never be forgotten by the people who were there to enjoy him. Christmas present is a major reason the holiday holds the importance it does to families and loved ones. Once a year, we come together to enjoy and celebrate the lives of those we love. Scrooge, at this point, has forsaken his only blood, who tries to include him despite Ebenezer's nature. He sees Christmas presents passing as his own lost opportunities to bond with those who call him family. 
Then comes Stav 4, where we meet the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You may recognize him from his cameos on this channel. He's a sign of what people feared, Christmas losing its spirit to the Grim Reaper. And this part of the story reflects that mentality. Those surrounding Scrooge's departing are cold, cruel, and heartless in his passing, because he spread no warmth while he lived. And Tiny Tim... Well, I'm sorry, this, this, this book is really good. <laughs> Hope is almost gone, all from one man's refusal to open his heart to his fellow man. Could releasing greed really save one man's soul from becoming ensnared in chains? No one knows the answer for certain, but Scrooge promises the spirit that he is a changed man, if only he gets the chance to prove it. And so we get to Stav 5, where all Christmas specials get their happy ending tone. He awakes to find that it's Christmas Day. He's alive and able to make right all of his holiday wrongs. He buys a real meal for the Cratchits, makes merry at his nephew's Christmas party, and gives his clerk the raise he's refused for so long. Everything goes well for him on this Christmas and all that follow, as he opened his wallet and his heart to his fellow man. The clear message is that redemption is one decision away from coming true. In that way, it does hold to Christian ideals, where a man truly repentant on his deathbed will be given salvation, but this takes that with a different spin. His own path to saving his soul helped everyone in his life to live better as long as he's in it. Charles Dickens wrote this story not only to preserve the traditions and spirit of Christmas he himself longed for, but also to show the strife of the poor and illustrate how a few rich men changing their minds could really turn their world around. While he wrote A Christmas Carol to try and make money for himself, it instead made him a legend as a new Father Christmas. He read his carol at more than a hundred separate instances, sometimes for charity, often for a fee. Man's gotta eat, right? A Christmas Carol was written as a reinforcement of the traditions that Mr. Dickens held as important, and it also serves as a reminder of why this season matters so much to so many. That's the reason so many Christmas specials exist. We restate why we celebrate the season so that we don't forget why Christmas was important to our ancestors in the first place. And with each new version of A Christmas Carol or whatever weird Christmas-themed spin-offs we have, we reshape and make the Christmas traditions more relevant to the current generation. Holiday celebrations don't need to be Christmas for those not Christian, as long as we're bringing a warm feeling in the coldest months that draw family and friends together to celebrate another year lived on this earth. So, as long as human beings remain social creatures, the traditions of Christmas will not fail, especially since entertainment will parrot its morals until the end of time. I'm Anthro, and I'll see you in the new year.